Part One of Told Under a White Oak Tree. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. Told Under a White Oak Tree by Bill Hart's Pinto Pony and William S. Hart. Part One say kate stay here it's awful nice and shady under this big white oak tree let's stay here till the sun gets low and besides i want to talk to you some about myself and the boss you know he thinks he owns this ranch but he doesn't me and you and lisbeth and wolf we own it <laughs> and by golly We'll run it, too. What have I got to show for my seven years' work in pictures if we don't own this place? Of course, I get lots of sugar and letters from little boys and girls, and grown-ups, too, from all over the world. And I'd be real stuck up and sassy if I didn't appreciate it. Which I do. A whole lot. But sugar and letters ain't real estate. I just want to tell you that this is New Hall, California, and right in the foothills, and land is worth something here. This ain't no sand and sagebrush country. And we are all partners, and it'll bring us in some money some day. Any little family rouse like I had with Lisbeth this morning don't change the case none. She's a mule, but she likes us a whole lot and while we make her believe we don't care much about her don't let any one come round and abuse her none not while you and me and wolf's livin or there'll be people singin hymns and the ones that tries to hurt lisbeth won't hear the music nor know there's a funeral goin on at all wolf he doesn't need no protectin nor affection nor nothin him being born way up in alaska he's almost as big and strong as lisbeth and him just a dog say if you see him comin tip me off i ate his breakfast this morning and i can run faster than he can but here comes lisbeth hey lisbeth lisbeth come over here in the shade i won't hurt you you must have come from the south where niggers and mules go to sleep standing up in the sun that's right old long ears come on in me and cactus is making a talk and i got a whole lot to say and right now when it's too hot in the open is a good time to say it now you all just make yourself comfortable and do a lot of listening because you're my sweetheart kate and you're my partner mule wolf's our partner too but he don't savvy horse talk and besides i reckon he's still looking for that lost breakfast gee it was good cornmeal mush gee this is going to be a talk like the engine chief makes every morning to his people up in nevada where i come from you know they don't have newspapers and the chief he tells em all what's happened the day before and they listen too you bet just like you folks got to do well to begin big bill says we are going to rest for six months longer he can double his bed if he wants to we won't holler none pictures is great but when you've worked in em for seven years like me and big bill did a rest ain't so bad before i struck up with bill and allowed him to be nice to me and ride me and right here i want to say that allow him to ride me is no mistake of the printer i can throw him any time i want to if it's cool weather early morning and i'm feelin good but i'm getting away from my story as the newspaper man says now to get back before Bill and me became friends, I was rowed by a mean cuss. He was Mexican, 
and he was so mean he'd put ground glass in a baby's milk or steal the pants off a dog now most times a mexican is good to a hoss because they know if they bung up and abuse their hoss they can't travel none but this mexican was bad when he was born the devil he laughed and snake eyes just come out of the chuckle snake eye nice name for a human ain't it snake eye long after bill was writing me and i had improved a lot and looked fat and shining and full of pep snake eye he come to bill and wanted to borrow me for a cowboy parade right after the california senate passed a law against profanity and governor stevens signed it without even looking at it that was the same time mayor rolfe of san francisco sent a telegram to los angeles offering help thought it was an earthquake and the mexican government got a big ship and took a whole load of mexicans home free of course i don't mean to say all these things was account of me but the fact remains that snake eye was the first one to go aboard the ship so the bet goes as it lays i got lots and lots of time to think now and sometimes when bill he stands a patting my nose and rubbing me gentle like behind the ears i get kind of sentimental and i think back about all the times me and bill has been up against it and what we been through i remember once we had to do a ride down a crooked winding mountain trail and it had been raining and the ground was all soft and slippery when we was climbing up and i was slipping and flopping all over i said to bill gee what is this going to be do i wear skates and bill he said quiet like doggone him he gets my goat when he gets in danger he gets so quiet it's just well there's nothing between us and silence that's all but i'm off again talking about bill when all he had to do was sit on my back uh, but anyhow bill he said we got to do it partner and that ain't the worst of it when we get near the bottom i got to throw you and we do a hula hand or whatever comes to us because long cheney he's supposed to shoot you in the story and you go down i didn't have a whole lot of wind left as i was climbing or slipping near straight up but i said say bill why all the favoritism why don't they shoot you once in a while and you fall off and let me be the hero and run past the camera but we was up to the top now and bill said nothing he just looked down and i looked down and we only had to look past our toes to do it it was sure some nasty place if you slipped you'd have to walk a mile to get back but they waved down below and cliff smith shouted come ahead come ahead and i jumped lit running and we was off i just kept my feet working i didn't dare hit the ground heavy or i'd slide all over the place we made it more'n halfway and then i got the cue on my right rein and heard the boss say now pardner now pardner and we took it golly 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 what a sensation we had i was all over bill and he was all over me but no matter how tough we felt it wasn't in it with how we looked leastwise how bill looked after it was all over i couldn't see myself and if i could i wouldn't talk about it none if i looked anything like bill did bill looked like he'd been having a bout with t and t or jack dempsey his front looked like his back and his back looked like hell i could only squint when he was off saddling me because my eyes was full of mud but what i could see was enough and then one of the gang said now we can get that easy ride over on the flat but bill said not this day boys this pony has done his day's work and i reckon i had too i was limping just a little bit all this sounds easy 
sounds like nothing at all but i ain't strong on language and can't tell it very well but to anyone that's interested i say don't try it it's no fun to tear straight down a hill on slippery mud and then let go on all holts and fall and have a man weighing a hundred and ninety pounds under you and on top of you and all over you and all the time you're rolling and hitting rocks and things come to think of it it ain't no family reunion for the man either because i weigh nine hundred and ninety end of part one Part Two of Told Under a White Oak Tree. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. Told Under a White Oak Tree by Bill Hart's Pinto Pony and William S. Hart. I've heard actors talk a lot about highlights. It's something to do with putting paint on your face in a way to make something stand out. So I reckon that's a good word for me to use, because I'm an actor, but I don't have to paint. The man what made the world and hosses and everything, he painted me. And there is such a man, you bet. I'm a hoss and I know, because I got hoss sense. But about them highlights, there's a lot of them. But the next one I remember is one day, Big Bill. He come over to the corral with a bunch of the boys. And I dragged my ball and chain over close to the fence because I wanted to hear what was going on. I say ball and chain on the level. Afore Bill owned me, they always used to put a chain on my hind leg with a ball on the end of it. A big heavy chain, too, almost as thick as my leg, because the other hosses liked the corral and liked to stay in it. And I being kicked so much by Snake Eye, I got mean and ornery like he was, and I kicked them out. So they put that doggone half ton of iron on me, and I had to stand there and let that dynamite hoss and his friends laugh at me. When if I was free, I could have had him and his friends and all on the ground five seconds after the bell. Well, when the gang started to talk, I was wishing the earth would swallow me, for they was all talking about what a great jumper dynamite was. I knowed it was true, for he has jumped over the fence to get away from my heels lots of times. Oh, Bill had to have a hoss to jump through a window, and the gang was all saying he'd just have to take dynamite, as no one had ever seen me jump, and I never had neither, and I had to stand there just quivering and waiting to be passed up. Bill, he thought a long time, and then he said, Boys, I reckon you all know what you're talking about. And I know you're all anxious to see me put over this stunt, what's never been done before. But somehow I just can't pass up the little paint house. You know, we ain't a-going to jump over a hurdle out in the open. We're going to go through a window. Dynamite can jump, but he might get scared and not try. The little paint has never jumped, but he won't scare none and i know he'll try right there i was swelling up and looking indifferent but gee how i would have liked to give the boss a handshake some of the boys hereupon got sort of riled up and king what's our ranch foreman here now said a jumpin hoss is a jumpin hoss tain't all hosses can jump and deacon whitmore he said all the grittin' hosses ain't tucked into one. And Fat Jones, he said, I never did cotton to calicoes nohow. Solid colors for mine. And then Curly Eagles wound up with, Say, Bill, you're losing your judgment and getting plumb chicken-hearted. 
over that paint house the boss stiffened just a little but gee he made me sore there was that doggone silence again and he said after looking him over careful who's to ride this house you fellers or me he didn't say no more just climbed over the fence and i nosed him and he said you little son of a gun that night just afore dark when everyone had gone home and i was chewing hay the boss he come and got me and took me up to the top of the hill where i never went before where the big stage was where they took all the indoor pictures he led me round to the back door and put my head up against it and then he slapped me on my tail and said go on paint i thought he was going nutty but i always do as i'm told when i think he means it so i walked through the door which just swung open when i hit it with my head there was no one inside just a big bare saloon with a bar and round tables and chairs all over the boss he took me straight across the room lengthwise and put my head right up against the window and right then i commenced to get wise i was to come a-runnin head first through the back door keep right on goin and jump through the window i didn't want to rob the boss of the idea of teaching me so i let him do it first he got a hammer or a hatchet yes it was a hatchet and took out the window then he made me stand close and stick my head way through and look all over outside then he led me back a bit and got on me and kicked me a little and just for that little kick i had a little fun with him i took it on the run but i stopped kerplunk at the window never tried to leave the floor and the boss he got down and petted me and talked soft to me and gee i was ashamed oh golly i felt mean and wanted to turn away and go to it and thunderation the boss thought i was scared gee it was awful if i could only use human language how i would have loved to do it right there but i couldn't so i could only nose him and listen and he said paint this board floor is a bad take-off and you must try not to slip and this two-by-four bottom of the window is three feet two inches from the ground so you got to get up in the air and not forgetting old-timer that there won't be more than six inches to spare each side of my legs and nothing to speak of over my head and me riding low he didn't say no more just petted me a minute and got on me and rode me back and when he wheeled me i was gone and outside before you could say jackrabbit three times the boss he don't swear much only when he's mad and i was kind of surprised when he got off me and looked at me and said well i'm damned then he took off his hat and scratched my head and led me around the back door and inside again and i was wondering what it was all about until i see him pick up a bundle he had brought with him and take out some stuff that you could see through and that looked like fine chicken wire only it was soft he took the hammer and some tacks and nailed it up over the window and got on me again and we went through it and i had the soft stuff cheesecloth the boss called it all around my head just like little girls do when they dress in white and parade then the boss just pulled it off and left me standing and went inside and i heard the hammer going and i knowed he was putting the window back in and then he comes back and just grinned and we went back to the corral the next day was the big doings and maybe i wasn't proud when they came and got me and took the ball and chain off my hind leg and maybe i didn't upstage that bunch of hosses and sidle over and try to get a kick at dynamite when i was going out 
no use trying to say i didn't because i'll tell the world i did and he got it too and he just beat it like a coyote i don't bear malice none but i stay mad a long time and right here i want to say there's just two things i hate and dynamite is both of em well when we got up the hill the boss he took me through the back door again and he led me this time the saloon was just full of people must have been two hundred and all the lights was spittin sparks and the camera was up on the platforms and the boss he just led me over to the window again and petted me never saying a word and then he started to lead me back out and halfway out he stopped and talked to two actors and said now willis you and ross stand right here don't get over four feet away from this spot and i didn't understand what this had to do with us until we got outside the back door and it closed and the boss took down his rope and started to make a loop i turned my head and looked at him kind of inquiring like and he said that's it partner i got to rope him as we go through so you see how much depends on you hitting that window plumb center i just couldn't help the look of scorn that came into my eyes and he got it because he said quick you're right paint dynamite couldn't have done it in a million years he'd have broke my neck so i knowed he understood and i was satisfied i worked a lot in pictures and i've seen a lot of stunts pulled off and never seen actors or extra people turn a hair they get used to em but when me and the boss hit the ground outside and willis and ross come piling through the window on the end of that rope and the camera stopped grinding there was two hundred people jumping up in the air and shouting in that saloon we was outside but they made noise enough to hear em in china the boss he slid off me and looked me over and found a little scratch on my nose where the glass had cut me and the doggone fool he put his mouth right down to it and then turned away wiping his eyes maybe it's things like that which make all the little boys like my boss and think he's a hero of course i think they should only i can't see why they should when i do all the work but i suppose it must be fine for a boy to have something to look up to a regular hero it must be healthy for him and give him a high mark to shoot at and just kind of make him feel stimulated and warm all over because he wants to grow up and be like his hero big bill he says it's fine for the boys but tough on me just think what i got to try and live up to says he and how can i do it when i got an ornery no-account cuss like you meaning me hanging round <laughs> doggone him he always blames me but i'm getting off the trail i got to tell about some more of them their highlights pronto or i'll keep you folks here under the trees all day and it's getting near feeding time end of part two part three of told under a white oak tree this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. Told under a white oak tree. By Bill Hart's Pinto Pony and William S. Hart. Part 3. You folks was never up in the Chatsworth country, were you? There must have been a terrible row up there sometime between the earth and the stars and such things 
because that country is just a bunch of dry arroyos and draws and big rocks boulders that go so high they shut out the sun well chatsworth was where we had our next little affair which has to do with highlights we was to do a stunt for the narrow trail the boss he wrote the story for himself and i copped it if you people could read i could show you the notices and prove it to you uh, but don't ever say anything to the boss that i said so it's a sore spot with him and i don't want to see you folks get it wrong well this was some stunt when i looked at it first i just couldn't believe my eyes they had found a canyon where a tree about a hundred feet long had fallen across and on the far side it was only wide enough for the branches to grow out of it and way down below more feet than i can count i only know as high as twenty now was the bottom all rocks too the boss he led me up to the high place where the thick end of the tree was and that end didn't look as wide as a barn door to me neither and just let me contemplate it didn't take me long to do it i said right quick what are you aiming to take me home in a wagon or a truck or are you going to bury me right here in the rocks he didn't say a word and then i cut loose because i knew i had him and i rubbed it in you see they could have got rubber shoes for me but they didn't and the boss he blamed himself for not doing it personal and i just rode him to death and with a whole lot of reason too because i was to walk across that tree making a getaway for the boss and me didn't even have corks on i was smooth shod and i could have had rubber shoes but blame it on the property man i said that's what they always do in pictures cause no one can ever find him that's what i wound up with saying to the boss ah golly he felt bad and i knew it but here we were miles and miles from home and a two thousand dollar day lost if we didn't go through so after i had jawed till my teeth hurt i sidled over and rubbed up against bill which meant let's go so far as i was concerned i ain't claiming that bill didn't say nothing about them rubber shoes what i didn't have he said a whole lot but doggone it talk don't make rubber shoes for a hoss any more than it makes tires for a henry but i had said let's go and that settled it for when i was ready they all had to step i ain't got nothing to say about the first trip because nothing happened we made it it was the second trip when the fireworks started the boss of course no credit to him had let me go straight across but scorpions and tarantulas they wanted a close-up of me in the middle of the log pausing like and bill petting me and talking nice all for the story of course and it couldn't be got in the long shot without me standing there a week for joe to switch the camera so we had to do it again i've talked about bill's cuss words afore so i'll pass it up this time what's the use of making him worse than he is when it can't be did much well we started and when we got to the center the highest place of course bill stopped me and started to do his acting what makes him a hero and me a doing it all trying to stand there like i was a wire walker in a circus it couldn't be done that's all and off we went my hind end went first and quicker in lightning bill cued for my front end too you gotta hand it to him he thinks kind of quick in a pinch so i throwed my front end with my hind end and we went down sideways instead of me trying to hold on in front and going over backwards 
We didn't have no time to think. We just hit. That's all. And I knowed Bill was all twisted around under me. His face was sticking out, and was only a little ways from my front hooves. He said, Lay still, you little blank, 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 runt. Don't move, or my face'll be a whole lot worse than it is. But his voice was soft and kind, and I, gee, I wouldn't a kicked for eight million dollars, and he knowed it too. When the boys got down there and eased me up, and pulled Bill out, it was my turn to be helped up, and I was a mess. My left side, my falling side, was all cut with sharp rocks. Gee, I was cut all over. And Bill said, Partner, whether you like it or not, you're going to eat grass for the rest of your days. No more pictures or work for you. That's the real inside dope of how I come to lay idle for two years. That's the real how of why the boss had to ride them other doggies for fifteen pictures. But the great American public, and some of the great European ones, too, had something to say about that, and just wouldn't have it. They kept writing to me and Bill all the time. A saying Bill was jealous of me, and that's why he put me out of the game. Oh, they said all kinds of things just to show they meant it. Of course, I don't know whether Bill was really jealous of me or not, but he wouldn't stand the gaff, and brought me back. And you being hosses, and one mule, and supposed to be wise, can draw your own conclusions. For my part, when you give way, it's a sign of weakness and guilt. Anyway, back I come. And right off the reel, the boss, he said to me, Paint, can you swim? And I said, Swim? What's that? And a bunch of boys standing ground said, You're up against it this time, Bill. But Bill didn't let on like he noticed him at all and kept right on talking to me. And he said, You know what a river is, don't you, Paint? And I said, You bet. And he said, Well, that's what swim means. You got to jump into a river and swim out. And gee, how I did chuckle inside. Why, that was my middle name. But all I said was, Boss, if any reward could bring me back to pictures, you've named it. I like to get wet. And the boys, not understanding my humor, laughed again. I'd a said more, only I was mad at the boys for laughing when I didn't understand what swim was. So I just lay low, knowing I'd put something over on them. Swim, if that's what it was. Why, gee whiz! Up in Nevada, I didn't only belong to lakes and rivers, I was married to them. But right here I got to digress, or whatever that big word is, for a while, just to tell you about my early life, Kate, and you too, Mule. Years and years ago, there was a big war. We Americans all got foolish and got fighting each other. Think of it all one family and fightin'. There was a great general in that war, named Grant, and all the folks in Europe, they said what a great fighter he was, and one big Arab king over there. He sent a present to General Grant, an Arab hoss. What Grant? He rode in the war. But when the fightin' was all over, and everybody said they were sorry, General Grant, he sent Red Top, that's what he named the hoss, to a friend of his out in Nevada, because General Grant, he lived in a big white house in a big city, which was no place for a hoss. This Mr. Nevada man, 
owned the whole country that was full of wild hosses and tame hosses too and seeing his old red top had been travelled from europe to america and that he had been shot at a whole lot by cannons mr nevada man he just said go to it old timer and enjoy yourself and he turned him loose on the prairie to go anywhere he doggone pleased and in a few years there was lots of little red tops running across the mesa and playing in the rivers and one of em was my great-grandfather he told my grandfather all about red top and my grandfather he told my father and my father he told me because we all had red tops just take a look at this forelock miss cactus jane and feel proud and you too you dirt wagon mule just you pay me proper respect and be joyful that i associate with you what comes from a grading camp because my folks come from arabville in europe and was all regular blue-blooded people end of part three Part four of Told Under a White Oak Tree. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. Told Under a White Oak Tree by Bill Hart's Pinto Pony and William S. Hart part four well in a few days the boss he come and got me and took me down to the cars and we started we was going up into the country what bill likes snore or some name like that anyhow it's in the foothills of the sarah's mountains i'm wrong on that name but i'm doing the best i can on names well our first morning in snore we started out gee it was a pretty country bill he told me it was the place where all the gold came from what paid for the civil war what my great-great-grandfather fought in we found our river all right and then i heard we was to get the water stuff for two stories sand and the toll gate and sand come first I had to jump off a cliff into a river while a feller on the other bank was shooting at us. Of course, the boss, he was on my back, and he sends me back out of range, and he dives under the water, fooling the feller what's doing the shootin', making him think he's dead, and the feller goes away, and the boss, he comes up, him not being hit at all, and follows the feller and gets him, and I being lonesome for the boss. I swim over by myself and follow him. Of course, that's all in the story. When we gets all ready, the boss, he says, Boys, I'm going to take the little feller in first and see if he can swim. If I jump him off that cliff and he couldn't swim, it would be curtains for him. Right here, I had my fun with all the boys standing round. I wouldn't even look at the river, much less get my feet wet. No siree. The boss, he tried and tried, but I'd shy away every time. Then the boss, he got down and commenced to scold me, and I said, Look here, Bill, I ain't wishful to cause no trouble, but I'm afraid that water will give me a cold in the head. But pretty soon the boss, his voice got soft again, and I knew it was all off. I had my fun anyhow, and when he got on me I almost jumped from under him. Getting into that river, I just played round in there, because I loved it. And when we came out, the boss, he kind of glared at the boys and said, Swim, that hoss has got web feet. I ain't going to talk none about going off that cliff, 
when the boss took me up there and i looked down i felt about as warm as a gas stove in winter with the heat turned off i just shut my eyes when we went and when we came up from under half the water in the state of california was i glad gee the boss slid off me to see if i was all right and i played round and splashed water on him to show him i was i like wet anyhow things too dry ain't no good no how if you walk on a dry board it squeaks we soon got all our water stuff for what i described to you afore for the sand story because it was just play for me i was just delighted in swimming high to show em how expert i was if we hadn't been way under before the boss wouldn't have been wet above his knees then we went to our toll-gate location what they had picked out the day afore and believe me they were some pickers it was a hole a tunnel or a sewer right through the mountain you can call it what you like but that is what it was it was about seventy-five feet or a hundred yards long there was an overhanging cave where you went in and the same where you came out and then it just narrowed down to a hole just room for a horse to swim and a man to sit on him and not bump his head on the ceiling it was about six feet wide at the water level and all through it water was dripping down in a little stream out of the rocks bill he looked at it a long long time longer than i ever see him look at any stunt before then he said any ledges in there under water to upset a house and joe the cameraman he said i took off my clothes and went through there yesterday on some planks lashed together and i sounded all the way through with a pole it averages eight feet deep except in one place where there's a hole about forty feet long where i couldn't touch bottom at all and bill said deepness don't matter none but do you strike any ledges getting out of the hole joe he said he didn't think so but he went through fast account of the current and wasn't sure then the boss he thought a long time again and then he turned to the boys and made em a little talk there wasn't any joking or kidding now they was some serious looking bunch of cow waddies you bet boys said bill this will be great for the story if we can get it in the story this tunnel is the entrance to an outlaw's cave and there's none of us got to go through and carry pine knot torches in our free hand so joe can set up at the other end and have light to photograph us coming through now you all got hosses as can swim but if anyone wants to say no they are free to do it and no hard feelings there was a little pause and then wolf Ferunda, the engine he spoke up and said wherever you go bill is good enough for us and bill he said thanks boys get ready the boys all got off and did likewise because a hoss can't swim free if he's cinched too tight and if he gets in trouble it's good-bye sweetheart good-bye when bill got on me and we was all ready bill turned to the boys again and said boys come single file and eight feet apart and no matter what happens don't move a man or a hoss until me and paint is the other side of that hole what joe says is about fifty feet from this here end be sure about that boys cause it looks to me like a tough job the boys they agreed and bill and me started golly that water was cold and we was going against the current wow it was cold 
but i swim all right and pretty soon we hit a place where the water didn't hit me so hard but it kind of pulled me down and round whirligigs and i knowed we was in the deep place but i was swimming strong and easy and away on the other end i could see joe on a ledge of rocks grinding his camera he didn't look no bigger than a speck and then all at once something happens that made me feel like death my front feet hit a ledge of rock under the water and i couldn't find nothing behind to climb on right there i seen it coming you know we hosses can scent danger and see our finish quicker than a man and i tried to climb i tried i tried oh god how i tried right there i could see me a drownin the boss my boss what no matter how he ever jawed me his eyes always looked at me so kind and they're as blue as a robin's eggs i got my front legs way up and the boss he was quarter riding off on one side to steady me but i had nothing under me but that whirlpool of water a suckin me down i struggled and struggled but it wasn't any good and then i put everything i had into a mighty leap but i couldn't make it it couldn't be done and over i come right on the boss him staying right with me the boss has told me since then never to breathe under water but i didn't know it then and as we went down and down i just kicked and lunged i was strangling when we come up the boss was still with me how i didn't strike him and kick him to death i don't know but there he was with his hand through his cheek strap trying to get my head above the water oh i am plumb ashamed of myself now when i think of it i plumb lost my head i was crazy i was facing the wall when we come up and i tried to climb up it the surface of the wall was rough and i just dug into it and climbed like a wild hoss that i was until i come over backwards on the boss again because the top of the tunnel was just like a half circle down we went again and this time i felt the boss and knowed i had kicked him because i didn't feel him any more but i know he'll never hold it against me cause i was dying i felt all kinds of things and there was an awful roaring in my head and i know i couldn't move fast any more but i kept struggling and by and by i come up again the boss he wasn't there but just in a second he come up too about ten feet away from me i looked at him and tried to say good-bye and i made a sound the boss says i looked at him appealing like and called to him anyhow he didn't try to get out himself he came to me again and he got me by the head and said god help us partner i'm afraid this is the finish and that's what made me say a little while back that there is a god and you bet there is too because as the boss talked to me i got quiet and looked at him just keeping my feet going to keep afloat and the boss said oh and he has never talked to me like this before or since he didn't seem to be talking it seemed to come right out of his heart he said steady pain steady i ain't a-going to leave you old man if we go we'll go together take it easy that's the boy that's the boy easy easy work this way pardner work this way and then all at once i knowed that he was turning me around 
and then i seen the light where we had come in and the lot of figures there what looked like spirits and then the boss said again now old man come ahead come ahead and i felt he was going toward the light but i couldn't see much i seemed to be going blind but i kept my feet working and all at once i felt a lot of hands grab me and i was outside and i felt awful sick all over but i see the boss laying stretched out on the rocks and i pushed through all the boys and tried to nose him and then a terrible dizziness came over me and i felt like everyone was going round and round and i was fallen and a whole lot of hands grabbed me again and the boss was bracing their bodies up against me and they let me down easy aside the boss i knowed he was there because the last thing i can remember before everything went dark and the sun stopped shining was putting my head on him like we always did when we rolled on the ground and played a long time after that i heard the boy saying it was ours i seen the light again and the boys was all standing around and the boss he was down on his knees beside my head and what do you think he was doing doggone if he wasn't washing my mouth out with water in a sponge just like i hadn't had enough of water i got mad right there and the boss said let him up let him up and up i come and the matter i got the boss just kept laughing and laughing and doing a regular engine dance and then he just hollered there's laughing this old boy yet and then he put his arms around me and hugged me tight and started to wipe his eyes again so how the dickens could i stay mad i just said to him keep your undershirt on bill it's cold the west is a big country and there's all kinds of jobs for all kinds of men and we was making pictures and we had to make em so everyone held a pow-wow and it was decided we would climb over the mountain and go down to the other end of the tunnel and all back in and joe could set up just outside and grind on us coming out and with a cut to the interior of the outlaw's cave to cover where me and the boss went down to where we come out we could get away with it this is sort of giving the picture game away to you kate and you too mule but when you've worked in em as long as i have you'll find there's plenty of heroics and stunts without talking about something what ain't and speaking of stunts the trip over that mountain about a quarter of a mile up straight and the same distance down straight wasn't no picnic neither i was pretty weak and the boss he walked and stayed with me because i needed help a little bit and we had some fun watching some of the other stock taken headers of course they couldn't help it because it would take a mountain goat to keep his feet what's that you say mule why didn't the boys come in and help us when we was drowning or throw us a rope why you poor specimen of mule flesh didn't i explain to you that the deep hole was fifty feet from the entrance and the only thing excepting god what saved our lives was that we was the only two in it with me kicking and thrashing round and you locoed fool if you knowed anything about a rope you'd know a cowpuncher can't throw a rope fifty feet on a straight line in a hole six feet across and not more than that high in the middle i reckon the only man you ever seen throw a rope was down a well with a bucket on the end of it <sighs> but the sun's getting low and it ain't too hot now let's go over by the house and steal some more leaves off bill's peach trees 
and if he hollers leave em to me there's no bonds like heart bonds come ahead the end end of part four end of told under a white oak tree by bill hart's pinto pony and william s hart read by chuck williamson columbus ohio 2012